Chat on Twitter if you want to follow people. Um, and uh, today I'm going to talk to you about crypto jacking servers. I was struggling for looking for a term for this. Crypto jacking normally thinks about uh, mining in a browser. We're talking about hacking into servers and getting them to mine for you today. Um, so a little bit about me. Um, I work at Ixia, which is labeled a Keysight company. Um, historically, I actually worked for a company called Breaking Point. Uh, which specialized in testing intrusion prevention systems and next generation firewalls. Um, and I've now gone through two acquisition cycles and ended up at this big, giant, huge company that has its roots re rooted in HP back in the 1930s. It's a cool place, though. I like it. Um, my job at, the, uh, at Keysight is to be part of the application and threat intelligence team. Um, I wear many, many hats. We've got a bunch of products that we uh, push our intelligence out to. Uh, one is the intrusion prevention testing systems. Um, another one is for uh, application visibility into uh, a set of packet brokers and taps that we make. And we also feed out uh, threat intelligence. Um, on top of that, um, I'm part of new product initiatives when we start coming up with new ideas of selling stuff, I guess. And I'm a developer, presenter, and everything, or kind of. Um, so that's basically what I do. I can't really put a finger on it because it's everything. Um, yep. So today we're going to be looking at uh, four specific malware campaigns that we dug up out of our honeypot logs um, and looked into uh, how they worked and what they were digging up and, and how much money they were making. Um, while we do this, um, uh, they all use web exploit vectors. Um, uh, we're going to look at some uh, networking data forensics that you can use and apply yourself if you're looking into this stuff or trying to find out if it's in your own network. Um, we'll look at the tools, taxes, and procedures that are used to deploy this stuff, how they land it, and then how they run it. Um, we'll even be able to get some partial attribution. Unfortunately, it's just a big, giant, long number that represents a wallet, but at least it's a wallet and not just nothing. Um, and to sort of set the stage for this talk, this isn't a talk about how to make Monero coins or Bitcoins or Crypto Kitties or any of that stuff. Um, I'm kind of a, a pessimist when it comes to the whole cryptocurrency stuff in general because I have to look at this stuff all day. Um, so I'm not going to get into why miners mine. You just need to know that they are mining and trying to find math beanie babies um, and then stamp them and say that they're theirs. Um, but you don't need to be a cryptocurrency ninja in order to understand or keep along with what I'm talking about here. This is primarily uh, uh, an exploit uh, development and structure tuck. So um, when you deploy a massive honeypot network, uh, there was a talk this morning in the same track about honeypots. Um, you deal with a lot and a lot of crap, a lot of events that just keep getting thrown at you all the time. Our honeypots tend to be low interaction. We have a couple that are high interaction in general. Um, but the attacks that we're looking at here, um, they are all hitting our uh, web and SSH uh, uh, low interaction honeypots. Um, they, the guys that are hitting these things take a spray and pray approach. So they craft their exploit and then they spray it out across the whole internet trying to get to you. Some of them use Tor to mask their source, um, but a lot of them just sort of use some server that they already broke into before to launch another campaign to go out somewhere else. Um, so they're trying to target um, massively deployed software, software like Oracle, whatever it is, um, or Ruby on Rails applications, or Apache Tomcat, or WordPress plugins are the worst. Don't install WordPress, just make it illegal. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, network monitoring applications, whoever thinks it's cool to have MRTG stood up, you now have another venerable vector. You've got to keep up the date on that pro, otherwise it's going to break. Um, and then the other trick they do all the time is brute forcing. Brute forcing WordPress plugins, Joomla plugins, uh, brute forcing SSH, brute forcing Telnet, brute forcing Samba. They just bang on it all day. If they get a socket, they're not going to leave. So that sort of sets the stage about the world that we live in and what we're looking at. Uh, we actually have, uh, we use this for, for our own uh, products and we push this threat feed out. Um, so I don't want to give you too many details about the whole thing works because I could get in trouble, but uh, I'll tell you because you're going to see screenshots of Splunk. So not only do we take the campaigns, recognize the attacks, 
and then feed out as thread intel, we take everything that we get and feed it in the Splunk and make it easily searchable through JSON. So that's really how we can easily sort of dig in and find stuff in there and look for new patterns to build new signatures for new stuff, which is really neat. So one thing that we sort of have observed is there's a general migration from uh, sort of like hack in and steal stuff or use this server to do something else um, that's also bad all the way over to uh, now it's just use the CPU and compute time uh, to generate money. So originally uh, when people were doing this sort of stuff they were looking to launch a DDoS bot network. We see a lot of those um, governed normally by like Perl bots or IOC bots, right? Uh, data theft, so if you are lucky enough to land on Equifax's site, you're gonna take their data, or if you get into Target, you take their data, but that requires a lot more um, effort than I think a lot of these guys really wanna put forward. Um, and uh, spam campaigns has always been a big one, right? Uh, I, I bet if any of you guys have to do uh, defense in your, in your network environment that you support, if that's your job, there's been a day where you're like, why am I blasting out all this data on port 25 off this PC? And it's because it's a spam bot now. Um, so I sort of classify all those sort of things as like Mirai, which is a little different, Perl bots, IRC bots, um, you know, launch a script, try to get the run. So that then moved over to ransomware stuff. Um, there was a lot of noise made about WannaCry, of course, but even before that, um, Petya was leveraging um, attacks over uh, uh, Oracle and SQL servers to uh, try to lock them up and demand uh, Bitcoins off of that. So um, there's been a general history of, of trying to break in and then lock the computer up. So this is more of a deny access and demand payment kind of approach. It means that you probably get paid more than doing extortion with DDoS or, or running spam, right? Because now you've got a lot more people that are going to be upset that they can't use their computer, whereas if the computer's still working but poorly, you might not notice. Um, <clears throat> and now um, we've seen it move over to just make the computer make me coins. So what this sort of tells me in general is that um, what they're seeing is most of the assets that they go and break into and lock up or use for this stuff, either have a poor internet connection, get taken down, especially on the far left, probably get taken down, brought back up. Uh, the ones in the middle, they probably end up on like people's computers that don't want to pay and just wipe them and reinstall them. But this one, they can just sort of sit idly by, mine coins, and as long as you don't notice, uh, they'll make their money, right? So you sort of see a decrease in risk for them. They're no longer trying to exfiltrate demand payment, interact with you in any way. They're just trying to drop this thing on there, right? On the far left, a lot of these things could classify as illegal activities. You break into Anthem Blue Cross and you manage to steal credit or socials or you steal credit cards from somewhere. They're going to go after you if they can find you. No one's going to go after you if they find a cryptocurrency miner. They'll just kill it and move on, right? Um, and there's a greater reward coming out of this, a greater benefit in general. You could argue that a cash or credit cards might have greater value, but it's a, got a lot more ele elevated risk as well. So let's look at campaign one, or example one. Um, this guy uh, leveraged, th these were all seen from December of last year to now. So even though if you're seeing really ancient CVEs, this is not ancient news that I've seen. Um, this guy used a CVE dated to 2012 and one to 2013. The 2013 one targeted Ruby on Rails, um, and the other one ran a, a, was a PHP core uh, vulnerability for remote code execution. Um, there was also a neat little JavaScript injection attempt, but I wasn't able to get the whole thing, but I'll show you the details of it. And I was able to identify them all because they all had the same wallet ID. So they all pitched into the same uh, mining pool, had the same wallet ID, so that's the attribution part. Um, and it was a Monero classic miner, more on that later. So, like I said, this is the cesspool of the internet. This is a base 64 object that you throw at Ruby at Rails and it runs it for you. Uh, it's fantastic. I, I wish I could get my computer to work so easily. Um, so yeah, um, and if you base 64 decode it, um, you'll find that it basically runs crontab. 
and uh, reads in a script that basically tells it to do a wget for this thing called robots.txt off of the innocuous sounding website internetresearch.is. Um, and uh, yeah, it inserts it into cron, says to run it once every minute. And uh, now we're gonna go see what the PHP one looks like. And I think you're gonna be shocked to see that's the same thing. <laughs> So, um, once again, uh, the details of the CVE are rather clear. You post to a URL and the PHP script runs it for you. Um, keep going, software developers. You're, you're really doing a good job here. Um, and uh, then at the bottom, this is that other one I was talking about. This is actually from our uh, SSH honeypot logs. So we recorded a username password attempt of a JavaScript injection attempt. I've done this thing, I've got CVEs for myself on this from when I was a much younger man on net screen firewalls. And what you do is you throw this at something and there's a web log somewhere and it just shoves the JavaScript in there for you. So it says user failed to log in with authentication and it runs whatever's in there. So um, that's obviously what that attempt was. I tried to grab that JavaScript. I got very excited that someone else is also weird like me and looks at this stuff. Um, and unfortunately it was gone. So I landed on a dead end with that JavaScript. I bet you that that was an in-browser Monero miner or something like it, or maybe try to deposit a EXE. So the reason I was able to attribute this to the rest was the same URL. Um, granted, other people could compromise the same server, but it looks kind of suspicious, especially with the timeline that we saw here. So let's look what's in the cron tab. Oh good, this actually came up really good for you guys. Excellent. So this is that robots.txt file. So it's not really in the cron tab, it's the script that's run. First thing it does is it replaces the URL to fetch and run the next time in cron tab. So he's got this sort of neat persistence thing. And in fact, there was another one here, but I didn't want to bore you guys with the same script twice. Um, but what was kind of neat is that he moved from using compromised URLs or his own domains to just using domains direct on Tor. So he's just hosting this on Tor now, so good luck finding where that script is hosted, right? Um, it tries to kill off um, any processes it might see. This one's not over exuberant about doing that. Um, and then um, you'll see this a lot in these scripts. This is, uh, if you go like search Stack Overflow for how to mine currency the fastest, this is what you do apparently. So you, you do a bunch of sysoctals and make your Linux kernel die or something, I don't know. Um, and then um, we got like him trying to kill other miners that might be on the network, on the system, right? Um, gotta, gotta, gotta keep all that CPU for yourself. <laughs> Um, and then it downloads this thing called .ssh. Um, it gets both the 64-bit version and the uh, uh, x86 version because you know you want to make sure it'll run. And what was really neat that I liked here is he tries to run it, and if it fails, he sends a wget to a URL that says failure and sends the user uh, the uname and the user agent, so he can keep track of his failed installations based on architecture and then make new architectures to execute and run them. So that was pretty cute. Um, so we take that SSHD script, and this, this, is, uh, this is for the, the, the young guys out there who are like, how do I become an amazing hacker and do data forensics and learn IDA Pro and stuff? I don't know IDA Pro. I don't need to. Um, I need strings. That's all I really need. So I run strings on this thing, and I pipe it to less. And then all I do is I search for the string stratum. You know that Monero uses stratum as a protocol to go, and that pretty near there, if this is a compiled binary that's got like um, default parameters in there, then the other strings in the C object are gonna be right near it, and sure as shit, right there they are. Um, so you got your, your mining pool here. Um, a little bit about Monero here, I'll talk more about it, but basically you have sub pools that all sort of do a thing with another pool, and Yahoo Finance gives it a market cap or something. Um, but basically, they, they, they sort of submit to the pool so they can pull out of the pool later. And then this is the wallet that he's using to do all the mining for, right? So he's got a password on that pool to dig out and pull out the money later. Clear so far? Okay, good. 
Um, so now we found the wallet, we can go to the pool, Monero hash vault something something, and we can find out that he's dug out 11.12 XMR, which is Monero, and we can see what his current hash rate is, his performance, everything like this. Unfortunately, this pool, later on, I was trying to update this slide, they now need you to supply the email address with which you originally submitted the wallets. I can't find out how much he's making anymore, um, but this is what he was doing about a month or two ago. And that becomes, well, how much real money is the fake money worth? And at the time, Yahoo Finance told me it was about 2,700 bucks. So he made some pretty good money using other people's computers. It's great. Here's number two. Number two is uh, kind of cute. This is the only one that's not Mon Monero. Um, Monero is based on an algorithm called Kryptonite. If you go and whack that in the Google box, you'll find out that Kryptonite um, gets uh, reset, I think, every seven days or something. It's a reference platform network. If you want to make your own cryptocurrency thing, you hear about how you can make your own crypto coin within a couple hours. People basically wrap some APIs around a Monero uh, Kryptonite. Based, uh, based network and then say, here's your network. So um, this one used something called Electronium, which I'd never heard of before. And uh, like I said, it's effectively the same thing. And it used uh, CVE 2017-5638, which continues to be a nightmare today. Um, I use this because I look in the honeypots, I look to see when the exploits stop being used because that tells me that they're no longer valuable and they still use this one. Um, and this was the vulnerability that opened the door for all of our credit reports to now be credit monitored for us. Um, so if you're unfamiliar with this story, um, you can Google it. Anyway, um, so if you've never looked at the Apache Struts vulnerability, all you really need to do is run netcat on a public IP address and siphon stuff off for a couple hours, and you'll get hit with one of these. Um, basically, it's a deserialization vulnerability um, where you basically create a Java object in, I guess the best way to describe a serialization vulnerability is that it's a byte, byte code put back into source code for the Java box to then make back into byte code to run for you. So what happens is, is that you throw this big object, this content type there, somewhere inside of uh, jo Apache struts, it does some magic thing where it says, this is a thing I should run. Um, and all of this like framing around it basically leads to, I want to run uh, exec VE or system or whatever you want to call it, another crontab thing. So it downloads a script and inserts it into crontab. This seems to be a, a common way of doing this. Um, I've seen ones of these, so if you see this, this is targeting Linux, obviously, but it actually te tests to see what the system type is. Almost all of them do, and if it's uh, Windows, it'll run, uh, you know, command.exe and tell me that you ran Windows, so we'll collect that for data analytics later. Um, I have seen a couple try to do both operating systems at the same time, but not very frequently. Um, so we go and we look into logo.jpg. This script is a little bit more advanced. Using xargs and the power of pipe, he kills off Apache, he kills off any other miners. He's basically looking to harvest all the CPU for himself. Um, and then this one just actually downloads um, straight up XMR rig, renamed as kworker, um, and then passes a config file here. So XMR rig is the sort of default platform for mining Monero. Um, and you pass it a JSON configuration object. Um, and then if you look inside the JSON in configuration object, you get the stratum uh, URL, where to report your mined coins that you found, and then your mining, sh uh, your wallet string. So ETN represents electronium. Um, but this was problematic because if you just have an IP address and you connect to it and tickle it, um, a mining pool will just report back with mining server online. It's not really, it's kind of HTTP, but not really. Um, so this presents a challenge if I want to find out how many coins he's made. Um, but then um, you can use this handy tool called Passive Totals, which is part of Virus Total, which is part of Google. You can give it any IP address and it'll give you a timeline of domain names that have been witnessed across the world from many, many name servers tied to that IP address for you. And right up at the top, we see that this is new.etnpool.info. 
So then you just get rid of those first three letters, type etnpool.info into your web browser, and you're on the pool, and you can see what he's done. So then we go see his stats and payment history. If you can see here, he mined a whopping 131,168 electronium coins. This is the same algorithm as, as XMR, and probably roughly the same kind of compute power that he's trying to take, right? And this came out, this lovely uh, cryptocurrency trades at seven cents. So that was only $9,367. But if someone ever decides that uh, electronium is the new Bitcoin, you'll be making bank. So this sent me on a tangent. And I was like, what, what the hell, heck, heck is electronium? Um, and I went and found their website, and they provided this timeline that went on forever, both ways. And if you go to their Twitter page, it's amazing. They have this bright, shiny new marketing team. They were at Mobile World Congress in Barcelona, and off to change the world somehow. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you can see here that they started an ICO in the 1st of September of uh, last year, and then they closed it out in October. Um, and then in the 1st of November, then they decided to do some security stuff. I don't know what hacker won U.S. Department of Defense is, why one is related to the other is, but uh, who, who knows? Maybe someone can tell me. Um, and they're apparently meant to change mobile currency things and make you pay with your phone, with their currency or something. So then I was like, well, that's interesting. I wonder what the timeline is of this guy between the ICO and when he started mining it. And you can see he jumped right in, in the middle of it all, in September 26. So here's the thing you need to know about cryptocurrency if you don't know. All the early coins, all the early math beanie babies are easy to make. They're a lot faster. You can make them a lot faster, right? And now, like, the difficulty rating for Bitcoin is up where you need a power plant in China or something, right? So he just went off and ripped through a bunch of servers and made 131,000 coins. And you can see like a loss of interest here as it got harder. Um, and I went on another path of discovery here and found this place, this forum called Overclockers UK. Um, just, you know, another PHP forum thing with people talking about stuff. Um, and they kept, they were all had mining rigs and they'd be like, this week we're now mining this. So they tracked the ICOs and then would switch which currencies they were mining over and over again to, uh, um, keep up with the uh, cheap coins and the easy coins to make, hoping that one of them paid out, right? So I guess this guy is sort of part of that sort of mentality of tracking that sort of stuff. Um, so, yep, so that was the Electronium one, so now we're on to example three. Um, this one, again, is uh, another Java bug. Um, you don't have to make your Java look like that ugly OGNL stuff that you shove in the content type. You can also do it through SOAP with the Oracle Web Logic bug, which was another big popular one. Um, so while this looks like uh, kind of like those, uh, that PHP bug, it's not quite the same thing here because really what you're doing is you're creating a Java object that then calls string, passes three parameters, bin bash, dash C, and then run curl and run it through bash for me, right? Um, and then the, the vulnerable service up here was WLS, WSAT, coordinator port type. So it was some config problem thing. So when we go and we dig into this, not a JPEG, shell script, um, we notice that this guy really doesn't want anything else running on the computer. That P kill went on for like four pages of just killing stuff off the server. Um, everything related to IP addresses, everything related to SSH. It, look, he killed SSH. Uh, well, yeah. Well, no, actually, that's probably uh, trying to kill another miner looking at the relative directory. So um, let me not make false claims here. <coughs> and then the other cute thing he did here was he kept trying to try to download different architectures and running them, also while counting how many CPUs he had and passing that as a uh, parameter in there to make sure that he really sort of tuned up the machine to run right. I thought originally when I got here, I was like, oh, this is cool. He's gonna try to like run the right miner for the right architecture and mine the right coin, but it's, it wasn't quite like that. They all ended up being just Monero. Um, and uh, once again, we just have a kworker.json here. So we open it up, we find that he's using the domain, so I don't need a new passive total. And then I find my 
you guys are beginning to see how this works, right? Like it's, <laughs> once, once you get a pattern, you get excited and you just keep finding more and more of these uh, uh, jerks. <laughs> so um, uh, this guy also targeted windows, which I thought, oh, that's neat. I'm not so good with windows. So let's see what we can figure out with this. So um, his string for this one, same vulnerability. If you looked at all the other framing, it was all the same. Uh, basically creates like a quick little visual basic script that creates an object to download a thing and then runs the thing that it downloads. So what you can do with curl and pipe in Linux is this complicated in, in Windows apparently. Um, but he also uh, would also run this PowerShell uh, attack as well to download a string called win.txt uh, which ended up being a, a window of EBS script to do the same thing as that up there to download auto exe. So what's kind of fun is that I have a lot of toys and a lot of friends where I work. So we have a, a sandbox environment called Cuckoo. So we whacked this in there and ran it and I was like, oh look, there it is right there, cool. And I found that the wallet was the same wallet as before. So, um, but then I went back and I realized that if I used a, a forensics tool called binwalk, I could just extract it out of the binary like that too. So I binwalked it and I did this. So. Um, put binwalk in your notebook and go download it if you haven't heard of it. Um, but this poor guy, when we go and dig up and find out how much he made, he didn't make jack. <laughs> so he made a total of 95 US dollars, 0.61 XMR. And this one is most recently. So I panicked and I realized I didn't have enough slides for my talk and I went and found another one. Um, <laughs> um, right. And now here's example four. This one's even more Monero. Uh, this one's a little curious. So once again, he, he targeted that web logic bug, the WLS LSAT, like the last guy. Um, he also targeted a uh, WordPress plugin called Cacti Weather Map, which has nothing to do with the weather. It's a network monitoring tool. Um, and then he also tried this weird cools.php question mark ID equals. If you do a Google bang with that, all you find are honey pots, um, which is cute, because <laughs> some of them are probably mine. <laughs> um, but then uh, here under December 12th to May 8th uh, is, is when we saw the length of this campaign. So it went on a long time, um, and we identified it by the same hosting IP address. There were different wallets used at different times of this though, so it reported the same pool. So um, up here, these are the URLs as shown in Splunk of uh, what we found. So you can see at the top, these are the cools at PHP mystery ones. Um, I guess it worked for him, I don't know. Um, and then we have the weather map ones. Uh, they all try to download the same shell and run it, right? Or similar. He kept changing what he was trying to download and run, but it was all the same sort of stuff. Um, at the very bottom, that's the vulnerability you just saw, the web logic one. So if we look at this, this is a Windows version of the WebLogic uh, vulnerability. And we dig in, um, they all download this thing called minorxmr.exe, and it tells it to run it. And then we also see um, this other way of pulling it off up here. Um, they're just different ways of doing the same thing, really. Um, and this time, uh, I couldn't get it out of the binary doing static analysis, so I sandboxed it again. Um, and it was a little frustrating that I couldn't get it out. Um, but uh, what I ended up doing was running it and looking at the network traffic. Uh, so I decided to approach this a third different way again so that I could uh, get a handle of what is actually going on on that network. So if you look, this is the Stratum protocol and it's run in the clear text. It's not run over SSL, <clears throat> so you can easily do DPAC inspection, write an IDS rule to find this or something else if you want to find it on your network. Um, and from there, you can find out who he's connecting to, and you can find a wallet uh, right in here, again, for yourself. So even if there are data forensics that are applied to this, uh, or data obfuscation that's applied to the binary, you can still just run it and look and see what it does. This one didn't throw it up on a screenshot on the screen, so I just went to the network data and I found it. 
Um, and that was kind of neat. And uh, this guy at uh, June 8th had made 1600 bucks and was still going strong. Um, I think that this timeline right here, yeah, this timeline right here is for the last day, so you can't really get an overall feeling for his hash rate, but uh, you can see that at that point he was still making some good amount of coins over time. But the Linux version of his attempt, remember, he, I said he did Linux and he did Windows, used a different wallet. When we went and dug into that wallet that he was using, we found out that he'd made a paltry 0.03 XMR. <laughs> Making sure that's right, yes. So you need a half an XMR in order to get your, your money out of the pool normally, otherwise they charge you more money. This is according to a friend of mine who makes this stuff. Um, and then up here, you can see, I can't tell if this is some compiler artifact or Unicode, but I have a feeling that this is actually some basic kind of uh, data obfuscation in the binary, because um, I saw capital H flying around all over the place in the ASCII output. So I feel like when it launches, it probably deobfuscates the strings, it just doesn't do a very good job of it. Um, and so what we did was, uh, I found that pool, and then sort of immediately below it, I ran grep and I pulled out the wallet right here. So that's how I got that one out. So once again, strings to the rescue and knowing the wallet size um, got me what I wanted. So those are the four examples of guys doing drive-by hacking, dropping miners. It's all the same stuff, right? It, you know, different vulnerabilities, I guess, but um, they're all just trying to achieve the same goal. Um, and, and like I said, we see a lot of that, we see it every day. Um, but there are some problems, right? So uh, Monero is difficult to mine, so I feel like uh, pretty soon they're gonna move on to other currencies to mine. They're gonna, more guys are gonna be like the Electronium guy if this madness of buying these things and selling these things continues. Um, What's kind of neat though is I can go to my friend who mined this for actually not really to make coins, but he just wanted to figure out what's it like, how does it work and everything. Um, and we observed the hash rate on the CPU platform, correlated it with some websites to make sure we weren't nuts. Um, and then using basic math, we can figure out roughly how many of that unit has been stolen by someone and probably how much electricity they're consuming as well. And I was like, well, that'll be neat and add some more slides to the end of my presentation. Um, so I decided to use the i7. Um, the i7 is a little bit old. It's a speedy processor for when it was made. Um, it gets about 500 hashes per second. Um, and I figured these guys don't get to pick where they drop their stuff. They could land on a 10-year-old server. They could land on, you know, my little website running on a DSL line or they could land on the mother load, like some giant AMD Opteron, who knows what thing, right? Um, that's sitting in a data center. It's all, who knows where you're gonna land when you drop this stuff, you have no way of knowing. Um, so, but I figured if some of these CVEs they're targeting are dated to 2012, 2013, then there's a good chance that the computer was stood up around there as well, or maybe even older. So by picking sort of this sort of, it is a laptop chip, but Picking this sort of common denominator, I figured it was a pretty fair um, assessment of everything. So these are all the campaigns. And we can see that the clear winner is the first guy I talked to you about. He made 48,000 hashes per second consistently, which basically equates to about 100 borrowed laptops. And if you take the 130 watts that are consumed by the i7, uh, that works out to about 12,480 watts. I mean, that's the most conservative you can get. That's a laptop chip. It's designed for saving electricity. Um, it could just as easily be, I don't know, 240 watts or something, right? Um, but what I thought was really stark was when I took that out and I compared it to um, the, uh, the average household consumption of electricity in America, that came out to 10 homes per day of, well, just 10 homes of electricity consumed. This is watts, not watt hours, right? Um, which is a lot of electricity to steal and to take away from people. It makes me a little angry. Um, the other ones all sort of came in last. 
uh, but they all consumed um, as much as a single home per day, pretty much, give or take. Depends where you live. Down in Texas, probably closer. Um, and yeah. And now, you know, you might be saying, well, I'm a really cool, awesome guy, and I've got my Moneros and my Bitcoins and multiple wallets, and I'm never going to let the Mount Gox people have my wallet and <laughs> I, all that stuff. Um, Monero is, has anonymity for tracking payments and transfers of coins. It has something called, like, uh, putting chaff in there, like, basically fake transactions to confuse analysis and making it harder to find and track real payments. There are other ways of unmasking that as well, which look really neat. Um, but the pools themselves and putting the coins into the pool, if you can get a hold of the original guy and his malware that he planted, then you have the wallet at least that did the payments into the pool. Um, once stuff goes into the pool, um, it can be taken out by another one. You can get paid out to another wallet, I imagine. So there is that sort of wash, rinse thing, right? Um, but still, you can probably then just do payment tracking processes and other things to figure out where it goes. Um, which may, led me to realize that basically mining pools are effectively a neat way of laundering cash. Um, a good example is uh, I live up in New England and uh, there are some people who will show up at the casino and they'll play two hands and then they go back and cash out and go back home. And the money they came in with is not the money that they left with. So, yeah. Same idea, right? Put it in the bank. Um, and so this is my conclusions. Um, it looks like I went a little too fast. I'm sorry, guys, but I'm open for questions once I finish my conclusions. Um, ICOs and uh, crypto night based cryptocurrencies plus easy hacks equal drive-by mining. That's basically the formula. Um, you're going to launch an ICO or you're going to have established coins like Monero. People are going to try to make my money off your computer if they can get on. Um, the mining pools, being able to go to the pool, plug in the address, make it very easy to sort of unmask like what the impact of that campaign has been. I didn't have to go off and try to figure out number of infections or do any extrapolations or anything. It was just there. Here's how much you made. Um, ransomware does seem to be fading in this space. I wouldn't say it's fading all over the place, right? But I would imagine that if WannaCry was around today, there's a good chance someone would just make a Monero or similar dropper and use that as well um, to spread out. They'd probably make more money doing that, especially at that time. That was before the, the huge ramp up in Christmas, right? So. Um, Pearl bots are definitely fading away. I think probably most of what I'm seeing is old compromised servers set up to just scan and infect other servers. So it's kind of like SQL Slammer or uh, Configure. It'll just be there forever. Um, pure profit can definitely be made with reduced risk for these guys now. They don't have to interact with you. They don't have to try to steal something from you. They just want your computer. Um, it's kind of like Amazon's cloud except free. Um, and, and, and when you start looking at this and, and the cost metrics for them are pretty much nothing now, it's just your time to write the code. Um, this asymmetry is nuts because everyone else is trying to fight against this stuff. You have to do patch management, keep yourself up to date, put, deploy firewalls, proxies, intrusion prevention systems, uh, antivirus, endpoint security, whatever you want to call it. You have to deploy all that stuff, manage it, pay for it keep it up to date, and all this guy needs to do is find that one server that you didn't deploy all that technology to, right? Um, and I think as M Monero's difficulty continues to rise, I don't know, I think I've read somewhere Monero's meant to always be easy to mine with your computer processor, I don't know. But I figure it's gonna get harder, and as it gets harder, there'll be another coin to mine that they'll turn over to. Um, and. What was really neat is that all of these use the Stratum protocol. That's pretty much the well-established way of doing it. That's probably not going to go away, and they're going to need to use that to interface with other people. So um, you're probably best, if you want a key takeaway from today, is deploy signatures that identify Stratum and block it and alert. And that will probably identify either people being cute mining their own currency on their laptop, although that probably uses nice hash, um, or it's one of these things. Anyway. Thank you very much.
just uh, to make a plug again, um, please go see the sponsors. Uh, they're still hanging out over there at the UC. Uh, finish the beer before heading out. Uh, we still got about another 20 minutes before the next presentation. Let's carry the picture with TLS.